Welcome all of you to this uh, wonderful presentation. My name is Karen Wolf. I'm the director of the Omohundro Institute. It's really a pleasure uh, to have all of you with us this evening for Paul Ringel's um, presentation on Schoolhouse Rock for a New Generation. It's a super pleasure for me to have Paul here. Um, we've been talking about this for several years since he first mentioned in passing, he was working on this subject and I was like, oh, Oh, we were literally passing one another in a at a conference in the hall, and I said, "Oh, you have to come and talk about this at the OI because this is really fascinating and important." And I'm excited that it's finally come to pass, and also that we can have so many folks join us here in our virtual world. So let me go ahead and introduce Paul, and then uh, Paul will take it away, and uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. If you want to put questions in the chat, I'll try to navigate those a little bit, maybe about the last. 15 minutes, if that's okay with you, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, so great pleasure again to welcome Paul Ringel to the virtual Mahandro Institute. Paul is an award-winning professor of history at High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. He is a historian of popular culture and he has focused on children and sports and race. Uh, his book, Commercializing Childhood, Children's Magazines, Urban Gentility, and the Ideal of the American Child, won an award from the Children's Literature Association in 2015 for outstanding scholarship. He's written articles for a wide variety of public venues, including most recently, he was in the posts made by history section, writing about gender and the potato heads. He is working on a variety of fascinating projects, both public history work, um, and in fact, he has published a piece from what you're going to hear tonight, the project he's working on this um, Schoolhouse Rock for a New Generation. He's published a wonderful essay in The Public Historian, the most recent issue. In fact, he's also working on other public history projects and other uh, scholarly research, including a monograph on Boston's Royal Rooters, an early group of celebrity sports fans. Um, and he has just told me that he's working on a graphic novel. Anyway, he's a really wonderful, um, flexible and energetic and creative scholar and I'm thrilled to have him with us and I'm going to just turn off all of my things and enjoy listening and I'll come back on and I'll watch the chat for Q&A by the way. Paul. Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank Martha. Thank you to all the OI folks. Um, yeah, we ran across each other. I think it was at AHA and 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 I just sort of said, hey, what's going on? And you asked me what I was working on. And, and you know, I think that was about 18 months ago, pre-pandemic. And, and here we are. So um, I know this is a little bit far afield. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So, um, all right, here we go. So we are going to start in 1973, uh, the year of the Watergate scandal, the year where the war in Vietnam is coming to an end. The year, the last year that the New York Knicks won an NBA title, and for our purposes, the year um, when Saturday morning cartoon culture reaches, if not exactly its peak, at least close to it. So Saturday, after, Saturday morning cartoons were a creation of the 1960s. Before that time period, most Saturday morning programming was run by local stations. And sometime in the mid 60s, the, the broadcast networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, decided that they could um, make a killing by running really cheaply produced animation and non-animated programming for children. By the time we get to 1973, ABC, which isn't even at the top of the heap, um, with, with programs like the Super Friends and Bugs Bunny and something called the Goober and the Ghost Chasers, which is a ripoff of Scooby-Doo. Um, even as, as kind of the middling level here, they're making, uh, they're reaching ratings as high as $20 million. And of course they're making cash hand over fist because not only do they have these, these viewers who are young and impressionable, they're able to sell them things like Fruit Loops and Easy Bake Ovens and GI Joes. And so everything is mostly great for the networks on Saturday morning. The only sort of storm cloud that's emerging um, in 1973 is a backlash that's coming from grassroots organizations like Action for Children's Television, who are starting to complain about the violence on children's TV. And that really comes, accelerates after the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in 1968, but also the excess commercialism 
and particular the, the presence of such heavy handed marketing and advertising in the commercials. So this is the one kind of blip on the, on the screen of, of endless success on Saturday morning. This is a fairly common, as someone who studies children's culture, this kind of backlash against commercialism in children's culture is a fairly cyclical occurrence. We see it all the way back in the 1870s with dime novels. We see it in the 1950s with comic books. And, and the pattern that repeats over and over again is that the industries tend to try to regulate themselves so that they don't have to have the government come in and regulate them. The greatest fear of the broadcast networks in 1973 is that the FCC is gonna come in and tell them that they have to reduce or even eliminate advertising on Saturday morning children's television. And so the way they try to fend that off is by offering educational programming. And that process is eventually gonna lead us to Schoolhouse Rock, but initially it's gonna start with a pretty unsuccessful slate of full length educational programs, 30 and 60 minute educational programs that run during the 1971-72 season. Um, the, um, the um, sorry, the, only show that you've ever heard of from this bunch is Bad Albert and the Cosby Kids, and I am definitely not going down the Bill Cosby rabbit hole today. So um, we'll just leave it at the fact that the long form educational programs basically don't work um, as a format for Saturday morning. So what the broadcast networks try to start doing instead is the rise of something that they call interstitial programming. And basically what that means is two to three minute little pieces of programming that run in between their programs. It starts on the local level in places like Cleveland and New York City, CBS, which is the dominant network on Saturday morning with shows like Scooby-Doo and the Flintstones is the first to pick up on this process. They run a program called In the News, which some of you may remember as a kind of current events piece that ran from 1971 to 1986. Um, one of the biggest advertising firms in New York City, McCaffrey and McCall, and they, they were, ABC was their biggest client, um, got the idea for Schoolhouse Rock basically after watching some of this interstitial programming, the apocryphal story, and I, I wasn't able to verify whether it's true or not. Um, unfortunately, most of the folks who made Schoolhouse Rock are no longer with us. There's one of the creators who's still around in his early 90s, and I reached out to him multiple times, wasn't able to reach him. Um, but the story that gets repeated in many places is that David McCall, the head of the firm, was out on a, a vacation on a dude ranch out west and was riding with his son, who was having a lot of trouble memorizing his multiplication tables. And McCall noticed as they were writing that while his son might not be able to remember that nine times three was 27, he didn't have any trouble memorizing Rolling Stones lyrics. And mm -hmm. so um, I, you know, I, I love to see, you know, the young McCall figuring he's about nine years old or so singing Sympathy for the Devil on Horseback. But um, I don't know whether this story is true or not. Um, but what we do know is in 1972, McCaffrey and McCall began to try to pitch ideas, and they weren't thinking about television yet, they were still thinking about audio at this point, to try to um, run, create songs that would help children to learn their multiplication tables. They had a couple of efforts that were a bust, and eventually they reached out to a fa relatively famous jazz pianist named Bob Doro, who ended up being the writer of most of the Schoolhouse Rock songs. And Bob Doro came up with a song, um, Three is the Magic Number, uh, which I think some of you have probably heard before. They took this song, Three is a Magic Number, to um, the Bank Street School of Education in um, New York City and asked them for feedback on how well they thought it would work as a teaching tool. Bank Street sent it out to classrooms across New York City, came back with the idea that this was a huge success and it was really helping the kids. By the time they got this feedback back, the, the idea for the, the LP, which was the original idea, um, had expanded into an idea for uh, interstitial programming to be the ABC version um, to match in the news. And so in January of 1973, um, Schoolhouse Rock is born. 
if you are here and not an OI regular visitor or my parents, you probably know uh, exactly what happened next. Um, Schoolhouse Rock takes off and becomes incredibly successful. It runs from 1973 to 1979 um, and is endlessly repeated all the way through the 1983-84 season. Um, 1984 is an interesting year for this story because um, that's the year that President Reagan decided that he was gonna have the FCC deregulate children's television programming. And that is the same year that Schoolhouse Rock was canceled. We'll hold on to that and come back to that point later. Um, but they reintroduced Schoolhouse Rock in the 1990s, I think as Money Rock, and then the 2000s as Earth Rock. Um, it won four Emmys. It's been re-released in almost every form imaginable. It's on DVDs. You can find it on YouTube. It's now got its official home on Disney+. Plus, and it's a, a play, Schoolhouse Rock Jr., that is very popular with middle school and high school theater programs. I determined as I was doing my research that the viewership of this program is basically uncountable. Um, we know it, it goes high into the millions, but with all the different formats, I just don't know how we could ever figure it out. Um, I do think, and I made this argument in my article that uh, this is one of the most successful instructional programs in American history, not only because of the number of eyeballs that have seen it, but because of the retention of the material. If you ask anybody in their 40s and 50s who grew up in the pre-cable, pre-internet era and was allowed to watch Saturday morning television, and you ask them about Schoolhouse Rock, they will spontaneously burst into I'm Just a Bill or Conjunction Junction. Um, believe me, I know because this has been happening to me repeatedly over the last year, which isn't such a bad thing, honestly. Um, so the influence goes just beyond Schoolhouse Rock itself. Um, Schoolhouse Rock has, has found a foothold in, in hip hop music. Some of you may know Three, Foot High, Three Feet High and Rising by De La Soul. Um, MF Doom has used samples of, of Schoolhouse Rock. There's a 1990s alternative rock album with groups like the Lemonheads and Pavement and Blind Melon and Moby that take on a bunch of the Schoolhouse Rock songs and give them an alternative rock twist. Um, Late Night TV has had a field day. SNL has a Schoolhouse Rock skit. Jimmy Kimmel has a Schoolhouse Rock skit. Um, the sitcom, the Simpsons, the sitcoms, the Sid Simpsons have done uh, a Schoolhouse Rock episode. Blackish has done a Schoolhouse Rock episode. Um, the parodies particularly seem to love I'm Just a Bill. Jimmy Kimmel's parody is called I'm Just a Lie about the Trump administration. There's a, a women's group that's done a, a parody called I'm Just a Pill. And so the next question then is if everything's so great and it's so influential and seen so many eyeballs, why even bother to mess with it? Why not just leave it alone? Let everybody enjoy the pieces that ran in the 1970s. And um, my answer to that is for some of these episodes, we absolutely can do that. For the episodes that focus on factual content, if you want your kids to learn about adverbs, if you want them to memorize the preamble to the constitution, if you want them to learn their multiplication tables, the 1970s Schoolhouse Rock episodes are excellent. What they, where they begin to become problematic is when they start dealing with historical interpretation. That really starts to happen in the third season, the 1975-76 season, because it's the bicentennial, they decide to do a season called America Rock, which focuses on American history, particularly on early American history. And not surprisingly, given the context and given the fact that these folks who made the episodes were um, advertising folks and musicians, but not historians, and that ABC, while they were thrilled with the success of Schoolhouse Rock, never gave them any budget to go get research assistance or support from historians, um, the history that you see in the Schoolhouse Rock episodes is, is pretty deeply problematic. And I just want to give you a couple of examples here quickly. Um, there's one episode that's called, I'm going to start with the bottom image here. Uh, there's an episode that's called Mother Necessity, which uh, is about the history of inventions in the United States. And there's a piece about Eli Whitney in there. And so while they're talking about Eli Whitney, the song turns into the melody for Dixie. 
and the narrator sings about how the cotton gin did the work of a hundred men. You can see the image that goes with it here. We've got these two smiling men churning out cotton, um, rather indeterminate race. Um, the, the hair, the, the curly hair suggests that there's something uncertain going on here and the Colonel Sanders looking guy is clearly meant to be a slaveholder. Um, similarly, if you go up to the top image here, this comes from the episode called The Great American Melting Pot, which is about immigration. And if you, if you could zoom out, which we can't do right here, but we've got the Statue of Liberty holding this recipe for the Great American Melting Pot. And if you look at the list of ingredients, it's all the different immigrants, Armenians, Poles, Norwegians, Koreans, and yet all of the, the folks who, who've been immigrated here either voluntarily or forcefully from places from Senegal to South Africa are summarized as Africans. Um, so these are obviously problems that, that make these kinds of episodes un unusable in a contemporary classroom. Uh, my big argument here in terms of the history episodes is that there are two primary flaws in the Schoolhouse Rock uh, America Rock episodes. One is a lack of effective and diverse representation. And the reason I, I word it that way is because there is diversity in these episodes. If you look at the middle picture, this is from the kind of the introduction to the episodes that no. runs a lot of time called Knowledge is Power. And you can see the diversity of the children. They're, they're clearly making an effort to have visual diversity. And yet when we go to the episode, uh, the, the picture on the left, this is from No More Kings, the um, episode that talks about American independence. You can see the stereotypes of the Native Americans hiding behind Plymouth Rock here. In fact, the, the very fact that, that the American independence episode starts with Plymouth Rock and draws a direct line from Plymouth to the Patriots without bothering to mention anything about the South at all, um, is part of a bigger problem that um, race is basically a subject that is, is completely, at least explicit mentions of race are completely avoided during the America Rock season. We see implications of it everywhere, but it's never explicitly discussed. Um, the other issue, which is maybe less obvious, but I think equally important, or it's certainly important, I don't, I don't wanna talk about equality necessarily, but um, is a failure to investigate the messy process of how change happens. The, as I said, the, the people who made Schoolhouse Rock were not historians, they were advertisers. Um, they seem to have taken a lot of their information from textbooks, fairly old textbooks for the 1970s. The 1970s is a period when there is this kind of explosion of diverse representations, uh, diverse studies of history and black studies and women's studies and Latino studies. Um, none of that, not surprisingly, is present in the America Rock season, but also, there's this whole concept that really comes from the, the history of the 40s and 50s of change without conflict, what historians generally call consensus history. And um, you can see this in a bunch of different places. I picked uh, a line from the Suffer Until Suffrage episode that's where um, the narrator sings, they carried signs and marched in lines until at long last the law was passed. So all they had to do was put in a, lot, a little bit of effort and things changed. Um, in the No More Kings episode, we see it, it's kind of in the middle of the episode, we see the Redcoats coming in with their bayonets marching the, the colonists back off from the waterfront. At the end, we see the colonists marching the, the Redcoats back with their um, pitchforks and right into the water, but there is no actual warfare. I'm not looking for, for you know more episodes of violence on children's television, but there's a lot of talk about change and there's even a, a song called Shot Heard Around the World. And what's really interesting, I was re-watching that this morning and we hear the shot and we see the boom sign from the shot, but we never actually see any kind of evidence of the hard work that it took to make change happen, whether in the revolution or in women's suffrage. I don't wanna to spend too long on this. I spend a little bit longer on it in my art larger article but I think there's an interesting comparison to be made between Schoolhouse Rock and Sesame Street. Obviously, they're not exactly the same thing. We're comparing apples and oranges a little bit here, but both of these projects come from really the same New York City creative culture of the late 1960s and early 1970s, 
Uh, I wasn't able to find direct links between the people who made Sesame Street and Schoolhouse Rock, but I think if I dug a little deeper, there probably aren't very many um, degrees separating them. Um, but there's a very different approach to these two projects. Sesame Street is really seen as a resource that's deeply researched and focused on expertise and assessment. They spend years getting grants and hiring sociologists and psychologists and all these people to help sort of understand the learning process and look at issues of diversity and representation. Schoolhouse Rock doesn't do any of that. They, they just, Schoolhouse Rock is really seen by the broadcast network as a diversion. It's a way to sort of say, hey, look, you know, American children's television, look over here, here's all the education that we're doing and ignore all the stuff about the Lucky Charms and everything else over here. So um, the other issue that I wanna get to next is that even after Schoolhouse Rock goes off the air, the model, at least part of the model for Schoolhouse Rock persists. Now there are not a lot of history-centered television shows for children in the 50 years since Schoolhouse Rock. I really focus in my article on three. Um, I wanna talk initially about two of them here. One is a show that ran in 2004, 2005, full disclosure. I was a consultant on this program when I was a grad student in Boston. It ran out of the PBS station in Boston and um, it's called the Time Warp Trio. Uh, there's another show that ran on Netflix in 2018, uh, has not been canceled or renewed yet, so we don't know if it's coming back, um, but it's called The Who Was Show, and that's based on a series, both of these are based on series, very popular series of children's books. Um, there's another show, the most famous one that I'll get to in a minute, um, but the one thing that I want to talk about with these two shows that they do in a much better fashion, probably not surprisingly, than Schoolhouse Rock is they are much better at improving not only the representation in their programming, but also in the empowerment of historical figures beyond white men. So Time Warp Trio ran episodes on Zynga Mdongo, who was a, a female ruler in Africa in the 17th century, on Mary Shelley, on Genghis Khan, among others. Amelia Earhart was another one. Um, the Who Was show, the, the basic conceit of the television show is that they take two diverse historical figures, famous historical figures, and pair them up in order to gain some comedy. It's kind of like a, a Rowan and Martin laughing kind of set, um, and but also to show some diversity of historical perspectives. So two of the episodes that I highlight here, they have one with Louis Armstrong and Marie Antoinette, they have one with Genghis Khan and George Washington Carver. I don't know why Genghis Khan is so popular, but there you go. Um, they do a much better job at, at representation, but one of the things that, that these shows still really struggle with is they emphasize change without a focus on the substantial and extended conflict that is required usually to bring about change. And, and to focus on that issue in particular, I wanna talk about what's maybe the best known um, American history kids show. Somebody's clapping, yes, I know that we've got a lot of Liberty's Kids fans here. Um, it's probably the best known um, history children's program of the 21st century. Um, and in my opinion, probably the best of the 21st century. Um, Liberty's Kids runs uh, a single unified historical narrative that goes, I think from the Stamp Act, it might be the Tea Party, I can't quite remember, but all the way through to the inauguration of George Washington. It has tremendous diversity of representation. We have um, loyalists and patriots, we have men and women, we have enslaved people and free blacks, we have Jews and Hispanics, um, tremendous success of diversity. Um, there's a really great article by Andrew Shockett, um, and I have a link for it uh, there and at the end of the, the PowerPoint, if you all wanna come back to this later, where he talks about the real problem with the way that historical change is presented in Liberty's Kids is that it really presents 
the characters, even though they're, they're looking like 18th century characters, the way they behave is much closer to 21st century characters. We don't get a sense of any of the structures or systems that constrain their behaviors. So that Sarah, the, the, the young girl there who's one of the protagonists of the show, she's an aristocratic British young woman who's allowed to pretty much wander the colonies unchaperoned and unsupervised. And Cato, who's the only enslaved character, he's a, a recurring character who's the brother of Moses, the free black man on this um, image. Um, when he decides that he needs to run away, he just kind of makes up his mind and does it. And so even in these shows where the representation is better, we still don't really get any kind of sense of systemic obstacles to change, systemic inequality, a lot of the things that, that we all know as historians are, are major roadblocks, especially for people who are lacking in power. If we wanna have some models for how to maybe do this better, one of the places that I think we can go is to picture books. And while there is a lot of problem still with the lack of diversity in picture books, um, there's a wonderful subset of books and I've, I've got a few of them here and I've put a list at the end of the PowerPoint if people are interested in learning more, you can go investigate that list. I encourage you to do that. Um, but there's a wonderful subset of books mostly written by Black American and Native American authors that focus on difficult historical subjects. And these books really do a terrific job, especially at their age appropriate level, of not only balancing diverse representation, but also um, models of structural inequality and the messiness of, of historical change. Uh, maybe my favorite is the book in the middle, Freedom Summer, which is set in Mississippi in 1964. And the white boy named Joe and the black boy named John Henry are best friends. John Henry's mother works for Joe's family. Um, all these two boys wanna be able to do is go swim in the swimming pool that's uh, about to be desegregated according to Joe's parents. So uh, when morning comes, they, they run over to the swimming pool only to find that uh, they're, they're seeing concrete being poured into it by the county government who is employing people, including John Henry's younger, older brother, younger brother would be something, John Henry's older brother to um, pour the concrete into the pool. Basically the county government without saying anything is announcing that they would rather have the, nobody have access to the pool than allow uh, desegregation to happen. Um, John Henry and Joe sit at the edge of the pool in disappointment for a while and then walk back towards Joe's house and decide along the way at the beginning of the book they had gotten ice pops. Joe had gone into the store to buy two ice pops because the store was not desegregated. And they decide at the end of the book that, that their small act of resistance is that they're with quite you know, tremendous trepidation going to walk in arm in arm in through the front door of the store and go to try to buy ice pops together. Uh, Ruth and the Green Book is a story that's, that's pretty much what you'd expect based on the title. It's about a family traveling from Chicago to Alabama in the 1950s to visit grandma and all the structures that are placed in their way along the trip. When We Were Alone is a book about a Cree grandmother and her granddaughter. And when the granddaughter asks about some of what she sees as her grandmother's peculiar behaviors in terms of uh, including wearing bright colors and speaking in Cree rather than English and having breakfast with her brother every day, her grandmother talks about how these are habits that were created in her um, as a young adult, because as a child, she'd gone to a segregated boarding school and hadn't been able to do these things. And so her, her resistance, her response was to take these kinds of small activities in her daily life and to make them central to her daily experience. So I, I really love the way that these and other books take these, these really tough subjects and um, not only give us just sort of diversity of character,
but also start to teach children about structural inequality and about the, the significant roadblocks. There is no kind of twirling mustache villain in any of these books. There's no uh, bad guy who, you know, all the, the bad behavior can be blamed on a person. In Freedom Summer, it's county government. And when we were alone, it's the boarding school. In the Green Book, it's, it's state law. And so these kids are starting, even as in elementary school, to get a sense that, that not all problems in this world come from individual misbehavior. They come from, from larger structural problems as well. And what I'd really love to see is some effort to take these methods that are used in these wonderful picture books and try to put them into children's television. I haven't really seen a program that does this and ideally I'd love to see it in a rebooted version of Schoolhouse Rock. So why do it now? Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why this is a really good time to take on a Schoolhouse Rock reboot. The 50th anniversary is coming up in 2023 and I'm still wrapping my, my mouth around this word, but the semi-quincentennial, the 250th anniversary, 250th birthday of the United States is coming up in 2026. I know that OI is hard at work on, on the 2026 date already. Um, so everybody loves anniversaries and this is a great time to maybe come up with ideas for uh, start talking about get, getting a reboot done. Uh, I think that the, the current versions of children's viewing habits are really um, conducive to something that's as, as short as Schoolhouse Rock right now. We all know um, Saturday morning cartoons are no more. They haven't been for several years. Uh, most kids don't watch broadcast television. They watch streaming. And, and if you have you know, middle school kids like I do, um, you know that their, their preference turns away from television altogether and towards online videos. I've got a link here to a study that says that, that kids spend much more time watching YouTube and other forms of online programs than they do on Schoolhouse Rock, uh, so, sorry, on television. Um, there have been some programs like this for older kids. There's a really terrific program by John Green, some of you may know it, called Crash Course, where he does 12 minute videos, really for high school and college kids to help them with curriculums, uh, curriculum on everything from American history to organic chemistry. Um, and, and those videos are incredibly popular. They have viewership in the, in the millions. Um, so I think that the format of, of Schoolhouse Rock and the sort of current trends toward virality in popular culture really make this a, a good time to think about doing a reboot. And most importantly, I think um, this is a long-term problem and certainly something that's accelerated over the last five years. The rise of disinformation and the battles over our nation's history, um, which are certainly fast and furious uh, right now, um, really exacerbate the need to train young readers and young viewers um, to think critically. So yes, we want to, to give them certain versions of history, but most of all, what we want to prep them to do is think critically so that they won't just accept anything that they see on television. Um, and I, I think that this combination of factors really makes the possibilities for a reboot of Schoolhouse Rock right now exciting, um, optimal. Um, I've had some conversations. I've actually started, um, we, we are in the very preliminary stages. I'm working with a couple of other historians and some artists and, and a producer, a kind of a diverse group of people to start putting a pitch together on this process. We're hoping you, to start pitching this to funders um, in the next couple of months. And um, probably the first stop will be to take it to Disney. I, I hesitate a little bit to take it to Disney, but Disney has the, the legal right to the name of Schoolhouse Rock. So they'll probably be our first stop. Um, but the goal here is really to, to try to create a kind of educational programming and, and even more importantly than educational programming, just a way for children to think about history in a time when, at least here in North Carolina, and I know in other states as well, uh, state boards of education are striking the idea of systemic inequality from the social studies curriculum. That just happened in North Carolina. I know it's under consideration in New Hampshire as well. 
I've been trying to find some research on whether this is a kind of a widespread policy that's being put together by organizations by Al like ALEC. I haven't figured that out yet, but there is certainly a move from the political right to try to eliminate this concept of systematic inequality. And so I think that we need, if, if the kids aren't gonna get this in school, we need to find other ways to start getting them to think in these terms. And I'm hoping that we can do that with some form of Schoolhouse Rock in the coming years. So thank you for listening. And um, I am eager to hear what you all think. And um, I will turn it back over to Karen now. Thanks. Wow, Paul. Okay, so I'm glad that is true that we passed each other in the hallway. I think it was the AHA. <laughs> and it was like, oh, you have to come and talk about this. And I'm so glad you did. This is, you've given us so much to think about here. Um, and I'm sure there, the chat will fill up with questions, but I have my own. So I'm going to take for to fear to ask a few. Um, Go for one it. is a question about, uh, I mean, really, this is, this is really so tremendous. Um, and part of this is just, you know, the excitement of, I think, the potential for 2026, which you're right, the OI is thinking about a lot. We've been working on this since 2014. You know, 2026 is an opportunity not just to bring the kind of fresh and deep research on an expansive and diverse early America um, to a wider public, but it's also the opportunity to bring to a wider public exactly what you're talking about, which is how do we think about the past? How do we know what we know about the past? Kind of those thinking skills um, and kind of access um, to the past. How do we, how do we get that? Um, so one of my questions is about Schoolhouse Rock itself. Like, so why, I mean, I think I know why, um, but why do you want to reboot Schoolhouse Rock instead of starting from something fresh? What's the advantage of doing that? And if you were going to do something else, why not like try Liberty's? In other words, why Schoolhouse Rock? Why do you want to go get that brand basically? Well, I think you just hit on it. I think it's the brand. I mean, so many people know the brand already that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, I, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel when, unless it's necessary. And so I feel like the, the brand has so much cachet already that if we can introduce it as Schoolhouse Rock, um, I think we just get a bigger audience immediately. And, and, you know, everybody I've talked to is like, oh my God, this is a great idea. Oh my God, this is so exciting. Yeah. Oh my God, you got to yeah. do this. Yeah. And be, I yeah. think part of that, you know, if I told them I wanted to do this, this series of short films about, you know, animated films about American history, they might say, that's cool. But when I say <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock, they go not. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So I think that, I, I think that the brand is part of it. And, and in right. terms of, um, your Liberty's Kids question, you know, we, we've thought about it and I've thought about it. Um, you know, we could do a, a Liberty's Kids for the Civil War. Or we could do, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, a, there's an endless variation of things that we could do. But what Schoolhouse Rock does is a couple of things. First of all, because it's this short form, it gives us a kind of a, like I said before, a kind of a potential for virality that I think you don't necessarily get with a half an hour episode. Um, I also think if we're going to do, I mean, the thing about Liberty's Kids that's so great about it is that it's a single narrative, but the thing that's the shortcoming of Liberty's Kids is that it's a single narrative. And so, um, you know, if we want to do, so the group that I'm working with right now, the initial plan is to do a series of episodes on Black history. And, and so we could do a whole, we could do a couple of colonial episodes, we could do um, you know, we could do some stuff on the Civil War, we could do Emmett Till, we could do, I mean, we, we've been brainstorming, we haven't really gotten to the point where we're thinking about specific episodes yet. But the good thing about the short form is that it lets us have a theme and then sort of range widely and also look for patterns within the, the season, right? So that we can talk about, hey, what's happening here in the 18th century in this episode is the same as what's happening or similar to what's happening in the 1920s in this episode. And kind of the, the general idea is that we could do a season on, on black history, we could do a season, I, there, you know, the, the possibilities are endless and maybe this becomes a thing where we hand it off from a bu one bunch of historians takes one season and then another bunch takes the next season and, and we let everybody work to their strengths. And, and I just think that 
between the brand and the short form, I think that if we can do Schoolhouse Rock, and you know, I'm very trepidatious about the, the potential of having to work with Disney, but um, you know, that would be both fantastic and potentially awful at the same time. Um, but I think if we can do Schoolhouse Rock, it gives us a huge leg up. Yeah, the the potential impact, of course, is is huge. Yeah, um, yeah, I I can totally see that, and also um, I'm sure, you know, Liberty's Kids is pretty interesting interesting um but schoolhouse rock is it the music just kind of grabs you and that was the original insight of you know schoolhouse rock and i think right. that that remains it's the education the real... for music and so so we're really working to see if we can find some some fantastic musicians to work with and we've actually yeah. got a couple of connections going that are potentially really exciting but nothing that I can share at this point so yes. stay tuned for further stay tuned okay all right all right all right well, um, I am, I'm totally ready, Paul, for you to like do this like amazing <laughs> house rock reboot and also for some kind of great call to historians to start doing their own, you know, yes. video things like, you know, I'm watching our, my colleague in early American history, Ben Marsh and his family going, you know, absolutely viral during pandemic with their renditions of various songs. I'm, you may have seen them um on youtube anyway so there's possibilities there i haven't um, seen so, those i'd love to send me one oh, i'd love the to marsh see it. family oh my gosh yes no it's totally stuck where we are rather than yeah anyway you'll have to you have to look up the marsh family they're amazing so great historian of early america and also like the kind of von trapped family i think <laughs> is what they're um so a couple of interesting questions um gabriel asked a, a pretty interesting question about can you say more about how historians can calibrate our teaching and public history work to children in other words you're a historian of children's stuff yep. <laughs> um and you're also thinking about how to produce stuff for kids so can you talk a little bit about how scholars who are not um either scholars of kids stuff or thinking have been thinking in the way that you have is there are there kinds of gabriel phrases this nicely any rules of thumb for doing this kind of work like how could we how could we be useful? I guess is is the summary of that quite good question. Well, that's a great question, Gabe. Thank you. Um, and and you know I'm start I'm just starting to learn this. And one of the one of the people that I'm actually working with, and again I, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be sharing names or not, but um, one of my colleagues that I'm working with is a scholar. She's not a historian, but she's a scholar who works on teaching race to children, and and so. Um, I'm kind of learning some of this stuff as I go right now. Um, I think that our first instinct is that we, we don't want to dumb it down for the kids, right? I think that sometimes we try to simplify the narrative so much, and obviously we don't want violence, and we don't want to scare people, you know, we're not going to show right. them Emmett Till's face in the, in the coffin, um, but, but we have to find ways to start getting these kids thinking seriously about um, critical ways to, I mean, yeah. the biggest thing for me is, is we don't want our kids, you know, our kids are taught so much about the value of um, freedom and liberty and all these, all these great things that we do in this country. And they are great things and that's great. And, and it's important that, that they honor those um, successes, but I think it's just as, as um, important that they recognize the challenges that go along with those successes. And I think we do a much better job of celebrating with our kids than we do of challenging them. Um, yeah. I do not know yet, and Gabe, we can have a continuing conversation. Gabe is a friend and colleague, to be honest. Um, so Gabe, we can continue this, this conversation. Um, I'm still learning. I haven't done a lot of, I've done a lot of writing about children and a lot of, but not a lot of writing for children. So I'm still sort of trying to figure that out. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it is pretty tough because I mean, our, our go-to explanation, it's complicated, is actually something that's pretty hard to do in a narrative format anyway, we all know that. Right. But we also know, I mean, you've got kids, I've got kids. We know kids actually know that things are complicated. Kids know yeah. that things are hard. And when you tell them that things aren't hard, they know that you're not really leveling with them, you know? Yeah. Um, and that key thing that kids always need, which is the validation of their own sense that things are complicated, things are scary, the world is full of tough stuff. 
Um, I think we need to owe that to them in their in the history we give them as well as, you know. In I guess the biggest dimension. thing that, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Um, no, the no. biggest thing that I want to do, especially because I see my, my students in my college classes struggling with this stuff too, is I want them to see the difference between, you know, individual discrimination and structural discrimination, right? My, a lot of my college students struggle with the idea, you know, there's no bad guys in, in the housing story. I've been talking a lot and teaching the long civil rights movement and we're doing a lot about housing segregation and there's no twirling mustache here, right? There's no Bill, there's no Bull Connor in the story of housing. And, and so they struggle to figure out, well, you know, what is really going on here with, with structural inequality and structural yeah. discrimination versus individual discrimination. And I think that they're just not getting taught that in yeah. elementary school or, or high school. And so yeah. I want to start, I mean, one of the things I love about those picture books, and again, for anybody who's interested, there's a list at the end of the, the talk, and, and I can share it with OI um, of the wonderful books that, not a full list, but a, a much more extensive list of books that really do a good job of, of showing you know, the problems as being structures and not just bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, these are intuitively things kids know. They know yeah. that things are structurally um, unequal and complicated at school, at home. Like they, you know, these are not things that are, these are not foreign concepts to them. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I, I just love the way your talk is bringing this out. Um, Sherry asks, what's your target age group? Um, uh, that is Schoolhouse Rock, the target age was kids who were watching Saturday morning cartoons, which was a pretty wide range. Um, yeah, I mean, so and I think- 2.0, what's the, what's the target? Uh, my target would be elementary school kids. I think like, like you know, six to 11. I mean, I don't know exactly if I, something in that kind of first to fifth grade range um, before we get into, I, I'm thinking about my, my sister-in-law writes, writes children's books and I know there are, you know, there are middle school books, there are YA books. I'm yeah. thinking kind of whatever that level is below middle school. So we are aiming at a kind of a, maybe like a K through five, which in itself is a huge range, but, but kind of a yeah. K through five range for these episodes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's so great about the Schoolhouse Rock songs, of course, is um, it's um, it's sort of like the best kids films. Kids get it, but the, there's some, there's a wink and a nod in there for parents, too. You yeah, know? absolutely. <laughs> so you really appeal across the range. Uh, Thalia has a great question about um, children's picture books that you mentioned as a great source of diverse and complex storytelling. And she says, what are your thoughts on slightly more complex stories? For example, those present, those presented by like American Girl and other kinds of historical fiction. What do you think about these as candidates for basing shows for slightly older kids? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I know a little bit about the American Girls. My, my daughter, who's now 15, had a, had a brief American Girl phase. Um, I don't really know enough about those stories to give you an effective answer, Thalia, I'm sorry. Um, but I do love the idea of also having um, stories for middle grades. And, and I think that we could do more complex things for middle grades. Right now, I, I'm really focused on this elementary school age because I think if we can get them early, <laughs> yeah. then, then we're starting the process um, and, and getting them off to a good start. So I wish yeah. I could tell, I wish I could say more about American Girl Dolls. I think there's somebody, I can't remember what her name is, but I think there's somebody who's doing some really good research on American Girl Dolls. So if you do a quick search, um, I think you can probably find somebody doing that stuff. I just don't know enough about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Nicholas asks a question or actually makes an observation about how even teachers um, have trouble dealing with the complexity of history for younger kids. That is that um, the point about your point that um, school districts are pushing um, a lack of smooth, let's say, narrative of American history. I guess what his point is that even um, the teachers themselves, the parents, they don't always want to work through this complicated history. In other words, how big is the audience really for a more complicated history? I guess is the that's the tough the toughest question. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I, I'm not sure of the answer of that. I mean, I know a lot of, of school teachers 
um, both my kids teachers and, and um, you know, students who are at our ed school who are training to become secondary social studies and, and a lot of them want to get that information out there. Um, yeah. And I have a lot of students who always tell me, well, why didn't I learn about this stuff in, in second, third, fourth yeah. grade? And yeah. um, I know in North Carolina, and you know, we have a, a, a lot of contentious politics going on as people probably know, um, but the, the state board of ed just eliminated um, the social studies curriculum is not allowing for talking about systemic inequality. You can talk about inequality, you can talk about discrimination. They also removed the word gender from discrimination. So they don't wanna be dealing with issues of transgender kids either, which I think is just heartbreaking and awful um, for, for other reasons. Um, but I, you know, Nick, I, I don't know if, or Nicholas, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what the audience is, but my, my anecdotal um, information from, from my own experiences and from social media and from talking to my colleagues is that, you know, obviously we're a group who cares about this stuff more than most people, but, but I think that I, 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 there's at least a niche audience for this. And the good thing about uh, the way that, that television and, and streaming works now is you, you don't have to have a monolithic audience like you had to have in 1973. I think part of the reason, and I didn't really have time to get into this, but I think part of the reason why Schoolhouse Rock shaped its history the way they did was they didn't wanna make anybody mad. And mm -hmm. they had this, this huge monolithic audience and they were incredibly skittish. There's an episode called Three Ring Government that I don't know if you've seen, it's about the separation of powers and it didn't run until three years after the rest of the episodes because they were so skittish that the FCC was gonna get mad that they were comparing government to the circus that ABC pulled it. So wow. they were very, very skittish um, about, you know, alienating anybody. And so I think that, you know, we, we're not going to reach an audience that Schoolhouse Rock reached in 1975. I, I don't think that audience exists yeah. anymore. But, yeah. Yeah. but I think we can probably find our niche and, and I'll bet, um, you know, the chattering classes or whatever we want to call them, the, the Twitterverse and people will get super excited about this if we do it well. Yeah. And that's the trick, right? We got to do yeah. it well. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, you know, you you really, you hit on something quite important there when you said, you know, students are saying, why didn't I learn this? Um, and I'm sure the same happens to you as happens to me when I'm talking to public audiences, I hear from people in their 70s, why didn't we ever learn this before? And it doesn't matter where people's political sympathies lie when no. they feel that there is a, there is a history, there is a past that we have able to retrieve through research and you know, kind of fresh analysis, they feel ripped off that they haven't yeah. that that hasn't been shared with them. Um, so I, you know, maybe this maybe this audience is bigger than we think. Actually, yeah. Um, I think anyway, be. I hope so. I hope so too. I did notice. I I, I don't know for how many questions we're going to get to, but Thalia, if you're still there, somebody mentioned, and I haven't honestly had a chance to read through. I have the, the oh yeah public historian yeah. with yeah. my article in it, but apparently yeah. there are two American Girl articles in the public <laughs> historian, my bad. I've, I've been so, so you know, overwhelmed with everything else. That I haven't even gotten to read my colleagues' articles yet. So if yeah. you're still here, Thalia, and you wanna read yeah. the American Girl stuff, go to the public historian and read those articles. I'm gonna have to Absolutely. do that this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely, Absolutely. She, she just nicely replied there. Okay, so my last question for you, Paul, this is a really hard one. Okay. I have to think about this. What's your favorite episode of Schoolhouse Rock? Well, it's not any, well, it, it's, it's probably, it's certainly not any of the history ones, um, <laughs> but um, it, it might be the pre, well, I love the music of the preamble, but I didn't even get into the, I, I didn't even get into the um, problematic imagery in the preamble too, that we, we can do that another time. Um, now you're a lawyer as well as a historian, uh, right? Re so are you, lawyer, thinking, yes. <laughs> are you thinking with your lawyer hat there on about so it's like the history stuff's bad, the constitution stuff's bad? No, 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 no. The, 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 the preamble, it's not that the constitution stuff's bad, it's that the history stuff's bad. Okay. Um, All right. Okay. The history stuff in the constitution, 
um, they have black men sitting in the jury box singing along to the preamble of the constitution from the 1780s. And I'm just like, yeah, that's not good. Um, no, no. So, yeah. um, I mean, I, I tend to think, as I said before, that the, the, the ones that are focused on, on factual, uh, the factual information are probably the best ones. I probably like the grammar rock episodes the best, like conjunction junction and lolly lolly and um, yeah, um, because they're just fun and the songs are great and and they don't make me cringe every time I see them the way I see I do when I see you know Eli Whitney or or Great American Melting Pot or um, even the names like Great American Melting Pot and Elbow Room now make me cringe. So yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No more Kings is the worst for me for sure. Yeah, that's a bad um, one. Yeah, it's really bad. Well, I have to tell you that um, my dad, who's an engineer, but is a recovering mathematician in the way that you're a recovering lawyer, <laughs> I thought about, I'm going to ask him to listen to um, three is a magic number again and see what he thinks. <laughs> we'll find out whether we think right, like, well, the factual know. stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, we need to, we need to hear from mathematicians. <laughs> exactly. Is there, there might be interpretive stuff that we're missing altogether. Right. You as know, no, we don't say it that way anymore. Who right. Knows? As a historian, the math episodes sound great, but yeah. you know, Maybe you're right. Yep. Yeah. Tell me what your dad says. I want to know. I will. So thank you so much, Paul. This was amazing. And I hope that we can invite you back for an update on this um, amazing project because I, I know we'd like to hear about it. I would love it. Thank you for having me. I really okay. enjoyed it.